Okay, members, uh, Ms. Palm Cameron has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually uh, in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health, in light of hospitals across Northern Ireland operating over capacity, for his assessment of whether the COVID-19 surge planning strategic framework has worked. And I call the Minister of Health. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and with your permission, if I could take slightly longer than the two minutes to answer uh, what I believe is a very important issue. When I published the surge planning strategic framework on the 6th of October, I was very clear that our health and social care service was likely facing the most challenging period in its history. This prediction is now coming to fruition with our health service under immense and sustained pressure. The surge planning strategic framework included 19 key actions. And I can confirm that 11 have been completed and 8 are currently ongoing. The trusts are managing the pressures they are facing within their available capacity and in line with their individual surge plans. The key issue facing our health and social care service is staffing capacity. And let me be clear, our health service is our staff. Our latest published statistics demonstrate the scale of the problem. And as of the 30th of June this year, we carried more than 5,000 vacancies across the health and social care system. The largest numbers of vacancies in relation to nurses and midwives, with a total of 1,786 across the entirety of our system. In addition to these vacancies, the system has experienced a higher than normal rate of absence due to COVID-19. The latest available figures show that there are almost 1,900 staff absent across the health and social care sector either ill with COVID-19 or due to self-isolation. This adds some 2.6 per cent to the absence rate across the system. I have taken action to try to address this issue through the Workforce Appeal. The response to date has been very positive, and with more than 5,000 applications, of which more than 3,000 are from health and social care staff. I have also taken action to commission the Critical Care Plan through the Critical Care Network. This allows for the potential to flex up to 158 critical care beds through use of our Nightingale facility at the Belfast City Hospital. I have also commissioned an additional Nightingale facility on the White Abbey Hospital site. This will be uh, an intermediate care facility, providing up to 100 additional step-down beds, which will be operational on a phased basis actually in a matter of days. So the insinuation that not enough planning or preparation for future surges was undertaken is simply not correct. In fact, it is deeply unfair on our clinicians and HSC managers who produced these plans. During the first wave, our HSC system delivered 12,150 new outpatient consultations, consultations in April. Yet there have been 29,163 in October. In terms of inpatient or day case procedures, uh, there were 4,859 delivered in April, compared to 13,301 in October. Similar, similarly, there were 39,907 outpatient reviews in April, compared to 56,071 in October. Mr. Speaker, I could go on. Overall, there was over 73 per cent more activity delivered in October compared to April. That was because of our surge plans and rebuild plans. So behind what may be construed as party political press releases being issued, that in fact is the truth of the matter. Mr Speaker, it is a testament to the tireless dedication of our health and social care staff. And I challenge any member to stand in the shoes of any of the medical directors across any of the trusts for even a single day to see the level of preparations they had made. And yet, even with all that, the gravity of the de decisions they are now having to make on a daily basis. So were we ready? Yes. But what I could never have planned was for the scientific and medical advice given to the executive being blocked. Because only when the spread of the virus is minimised 
can we hope to reduce the COVID-19 pressures on our health service? And that is what is really needed, and it's needed now. Thank you. And I call Colm Gilderney. Sorry. I call Palm Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity of being able to ask a urgent oral to the House today. I thank the Health Minister for his response thus far, and I fully recognise the continual challenge faced in terms of delivery of services in these very difficult times, and in particular, um, maintaining staff levels. I also welcome the imminent um, opening of the Step Town facility at the Netty Gill to at White Abbey. The Department's critical care surge plan envisaged being able to cater for the needs of 158 COVID and non-COVID patients in the event of a high surge across Northern Ireland. In recent weeks, this total has reached around 140. That is short of the number set out in the frameworks. If these, constit- if these contingency uh, arrangements haven't been implemented in full, why are we hearing reports that hospitals are operating over capacity? Um, and, wha- and have health planners failed to meet this target of available critical care beds? Uh, and I thank the member for, for her supplementary question. Uh, and I think it's important that uh, she, she doesn't confuse um, the two issues in regards to, to bed numbers, in regards to the overcapacity and also in that of ICU. Um, since March, uh, the critical care network uh, has had its, its surge plan in place to get the 158 uh, ICU beds uh, involves the utilisation of the Nightingale facility uh, at the tower. It also involves, which I think is one of the most stressing and strenuous points on our ICU nurses and specialists, and that's moving away from the one-to-one care ratio. When we move into our high surge and then critical surge, which allows us to flex up to those 158 beds, and it actually means that we're moving away uh, from that one-to-one ratio. Because no matter how much I'm challenged, how much I'm criticised as to what we haven't done in the past two to three months, there's one thing, Mr Speaker, that we can't do in two or three months, and that's training an ICU nurse. At the start of this pandemic in, in February, when we identified the utilisation and, and where we were going to need those additional skills, Staff members across our health and social care sector started to upskill, started to retrain in what would be a very critical part of our, our action against COVID, and that was the maintenance and utilisation of ICU beds and the challenge that it brings, not just physically on those staff members, but also emotionally and mentally as well. And that's why we put in place mental supports for those staff uh, as well. So when the member reflects, and I, I think when she indicates of our hospitals operating at overcapacity. Much of that is actually in regards to what is termed you know, it's our, our, our general medical uh, beds, which are, 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 you know, are, are there for general conclude. medical con- conditions. Okay. So when we have to utilise more of those beds, that's where we're seeing the pressures on the number of beds across our health and social care system. Thank you. And I call Callum Gillernu. And again, thank the Minister for his answers to those questions. And I will just observe, given the Minister's last answer, that our health service here did reach 106% capacity some weeks ago. Um, so the Minister is, is aware that the surge plan is to address an uh, increase or a surge in hospital cases and transmission in the community. However, there, there also needs to be a plan to suppress the spread of the virus in the first place. And the first people who need that plan are those hard-pressed staff on the ground, and we owe it to them to, to deliver them that plan. And I do recognise what the Minister says in relation to the inability to quickly scale up the vacant nursing posts or the ICU nursing. But what we could do, and what we need to do, in my opinion, is to increase our testing capacity, and we could recruit and train contact tracers at a quicker level. So I would like to ask, them, will the Minister commit now to bringing forward a new health strategy to replace the failing test, trace and protect strategy? Um, and again, in, in regards to, to the Member's criticism and, uh, of our test, trace and protect system, and I know uh, when the PHA was in front of the committee, he also used language which I think w- was unfair. Uh, in regards to our test, trace and protect system that we have in place, and I have given this update Mr. Speaker, to the House uh, last week in question time. Uh, at that point, we had 220 tracers employed over three different employment contracts, so we could flex up and flex down the number of tracers 
uh, who were actually working at any point in time. Test, trace and protect works best when we have a low case number of cases. And I think that's where I agree fully with the Chair of the Health Committee. That needs to be our strategy. Not how we increase beds, not how we improve test, trace and protect, but actually how we reduce the number of people with COVID in our community. That's where the real, the real challenge is. And, and to update the Chair, as, as of the 10th of November for the, for the week preceding that, um, 3,519 cases were transferred uh, to test, trace and protect. Of the, those 3,519, 3,317 were successfully contacted. That's 94.3%, even with that high level. Of those identified, there was identified an additional 4,987 close contacts. Of those close contacts, Trace, Trace and Protect were able to complete contacts for an additional 4,898. That's a 98.2% successful contacts being made for those contacts. That way far outweighs what is deemed to be an effective system. Most effective systems are, are graded at being 80 per cent or above. So even with the high numbers coming into our test, trace and protect system, they were still achieving high levels of percentage successful outworkings. And one of the things the member has asked for before in this place, and that's the protections or the support mechanisms. Um, that are put in place for anybody that is testing positive. And I welcome uh, the announcement from the Minister of Communities today, a member of the member's own party, that she has in fact increased that payment rate for those who are seeking COVID supports, and that's done through the Department of Communities. And that's where I've said in the past that the response to COVID and test, trace, protect, support and isolate is a cross-executive effort, not just solely for health. I call Colin McGrath. Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, managing mental health is contained in the surge plans and it is also uh, anti-bullying week and I have my old socks on today to highlight that fact. Um, but given that bullying is a significant factor in youth mental health issues, could the Minister detail what work is being done to deal with the legacy of long waiting lists to get appointments to be able to manage counselling and other psychological services and just how disrupted that has been as a result of COVID? Um, and I, I thank the, the member in regards to, and especially in regards to, to anti-bullying week. I think it's a strong message that this House can send out that bullying shouldn't be tolerated um, anywhere. Um, it's not something that um, I have ever condoned or supported. And being the height that I am, I can assure you, I have often been in, on the receipt of it, and never mind not in receipt of the number of the past few days where it has been attempted uh, to try to get me to. To shift from my position, and I can assure you, after being the, the receipt of of many a, a bullying incidents in, in my younger days, I can assure you it's hard to shift uh, from that mentality because those young people who are in, in the receiving end of bullying incidents um, at this early stage of their life carry that through to their mental, uh, through that through their their. their their challenges into their adult life as well. So, in regards to the work that has been done, and, and I think in response, um, on the 19th of May, I published my department's mental health action plan, and that includes in that the dedicated COVID-19 mental health response plan. And this response plan provided immediate actions across seven of the themes to support mental health and emotional well-being in the face um, of the pandemic. There has, however, been some changes in how services have been delivered. And unfortunately, many of those face-to-face -face meetings have changed to accommodate remote working, which includes phone calls and video, video uh, communication. So while um, we, we approach um, that service with, with different, different tools, different utilisations, the problem still maintains. And when we get through this COVID pandemic, uh, and Mr Speaker, I believe we will get through it, there will be a challenge in our mental health systems, which we're already uh, factoring in now, and I think that was why it was critical that we put in place in the Department's Mental Health Action Plan back in May that specific response plan to COVID-19 uh, mental health, because we all know that is what Mr. will Neither face us remarks, at the please. end of the year. Okay, and I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, just a, f a few weeks ago. Uh, we received uh, some evidence from a senior official from the Royal College of Nursing in, in the Health Committee. 
uh, around nursing homes. And she was asked uh, what was her views or opinion on moving staff testing from two weeks to a one-week regime. Now, she made the point that it would increase a bureaucratic burden uh, on nursing homes and, in, uh, and on nurses. Uh, also, there was a problem of nurses having to actually travel in their own time to get the testing done. And she finished by saying that she questioned how beneficial, in fact, this move would be, and that she thought that it was not achievable. Now, this morning we read a headline story in one of the local newspapers that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who serves in another house, had indicated that he was calling for uh, testing to be done on a daily basis for Remember staff, and question, indeed, please. at the start of every shift. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, would the Minister have any views on the practical uh, uh, benefits of, of, of such a regime? Um, and I thank the member, and I, um, I, I, I didn't see the headlines. Um, uh, but what I will say, and I think it's in response to a, a, a supplementary was asked in the, the, earlier, um, the earlier urgent oral in regards to, to mass testing. Um, my department's expert advisory group on testing is fully actually linked in to the national mass testing programme, uh, which has been led by the Department of Health and Social Care. So we will utilise and we will work uh, with colleagues across the United Kingdom to make sure that any advances that we use in mass testing when it does become available is utilised to, to its full benefit uh, and is utilised to actually suppress further spread of, of COVID-19. Because what we, we, we have to realise, you know, plans, those plans are progressing. And again, we're working with a range of local partners and experts uh, for testing pilots uh, across different settings. Those will include uh, universities, meat factories, health care facilities as well. And they will include the repeat testing of asymptomatic health care staff and, and, and the testing of employees as well. So I await you know, the response of the expert advisory group on testing. Uh, I had indicated that I, we were bringing a paper to the executive uh, on this shortly. Um, so I'm not sure maybe that um, Sir Geoffrey had received a, an advance notice that that was a piece of work that I was actually intending to bring forward to the executive. So maybe that's why um, he was asking for it to be brought forward, knowing it was coming. Call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, would you agree that the reintroduction of shielding could play a part in reducing pressure on our health um, service and provide an extra layer of protection for our clinically vulnerable? Thank you. Um, and again, thank the member. She raised it last week in question time and was able to inform her at that time that the Chief Medical Officer uh, was bringing together the shielding advisory group. Uh, they have met, and I'm waiting the out outworkings of the report that they're bringing forward. One of the things that they have, uh, the piece of work that they actually have completed, is comparing what is currently in our advice to those who are extremely clinically vulnerable to what is actually being advised to those who have been advised to, to shield in England when they have went into, I suppose, their advanced stage of lockdown to see what the difference is and what additional advice we need to be bringing forward. So that piece of work is ongoing, and I'm looking forward to the Chief Medical Officer actually updating that guidance uh, in regards to the advice coming out of the shielding, the shielding, the work from the shielding group. Call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do understand and realise the pressures facing both the Minister and the Department, but I do take issue with his comments that for anybody to raise the, these issues and concerns in this chamber is being political. We do so out of real concern for both patients, frontline staff and indeed health uh, care workers. Uh, I'm not the only one with concerns and I, I look to today Dr Gabriel Scali, uh, a professor of public health and planning and a member of the Independent SAGE Committee, who stated there is no plan, there is no strategy and there is no transparency. And probably most concerning of all, he implied that if a public health expert got five days within the department that they would take it by the scruff. Minister, is it the case that the public and indeed frontline health care workers are having to bear the cost of a failure by a department to manage and meet its objectives and implement a detailed surge plan? And in light of Dr Scully's comments, would the Minister invite an external public health expert to conduct a five-day review of the department's plan and offer a prognosis? And maybe the findings of such an expert would be in all, and one of the first things that they may actually question is the utilisation in the executive 
of a cross-community mechanism That's on voting, Minister. on voting down. Oh, sorry, just let the member. Let me finish. Apologies, Mr. Speaker, but you know to try and take a lecture of what the department should bring forward in surge plans when I brought forward recommendations to the executive over a week ago that we should extend our current regulations and restrictions for another fortnight, for another two weeks, so that we could take some of the pressures that we're actually talking about today off our health service, off our health care workers. So for the member to come forward and try to insinuate that it's a failure of me or my department, where actually maybe if his party colleagues had supported me and my department in the executive, we may not be in the position that we're currently in. So I think if you brought in a public health professional, one of the things that they would actually do would be to point out the failure in the executive actually to support the recommendations coming forward from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor and from the Department of Health, which was actually voted down on a cross-community basis and a cross-community vote that was actually brought against a unionist minister. No answer. No answer. I call Justin McNulty. No Justin McNulty is not in the seat. I call Sinead Bradley. Speaker, um, based on that answer, Minister, would you agree with me that the fundamental external factors that directly affect how efficiently any surge plan could work rely on not just the public playing their part and listening to the Chief Medical Officer, but also the Executive hearing that message, acting on it and safeguarding everybody? Um. I, I thank the member for, for her point, and um, Speaker, I apologise for the temperament in my previous answer was delivered. It's not usual um, for me in this House, um, but it is frustrating when I hear accusations levelled against um, the health care staff in my department and the advice that it's given. What I will say to the member, it will take uh, a coordinated, unified executive response to drive down the community transmission of COVID in Northern Ireland. One thing that is not factored, factored in to any of the surge plans presented by my department or the trusts themselves, all six trusts, one of the things that we cannot factor in is the failure of some within the executive to listen to, to the medical and public of health advice that is brought forward. Call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unaccustomed as I am to pouring oil in troubled waters, uh, could I divert the subject somewhat? Back in 2016, there was a nationwide simulation to prepare for a pandemic. Uh, uh, what lessons did his department learn and action from that, or was nothing done about it? I, th I thank the member um, for, for his question. He refers, of course, to Operation Cygnus, uh, which was brought forward in 2016. Uh, the, the publication of the outworkings um, of that tabletop exercise are now published on my department's website, so there is a detailed breakdown of the recommendations and the outworkings of those recommendations as they are, how they were carried out um, under my department, and of course they were carried out under the department in this place actually wasn't sitting or wasn't in being, um, but they are available on the department's website. I can forward a link to the member for his information. Caller Dea Flynn. For me, can call you. Um, Minister, um, I know that today the department announced some changes to how emergency and urgent care um, is going to be delivered, and this will obviously affect many areas um, and patients. Um, so the phone first pilot that, that's been um, it's being trialled in the Causeway Hospital. Can the minister outline, outline if this pilot is part of the wider transformation process, or is it solely um, a part of the COVID-19 surge response? Thank you. Um, and I thank the, the member for for her question. Um, she, she will be aware, as are many members of the House, that one of the things actually pre-COVID uh, there was commissioned. Uh, a review into our urgent and emergency care and how it could be delivered and actually improved on and the service could be improved on uh, across Northern Ireland. So the No More Silos reports uh, that was actually published and, and we expedited, we brought it forward again, it was published 
uh, by my department a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that was actually in it was the telephone first uh, as an option. So the pilot is now being run out. It'll be started tomorrow in the Causeway uh, Hospital uh, to see how it operates. So it will, you know, anybody seeking uh, support from an emergency department can phone first uh, to make sure that they, they can have quick and timely access uh, to the provision that they need to see. It is a pilot, but it's part of No More Silos. It's part of the one, one of the ten um, recommendations. So if, if successful, it is the intention that it will be rolled out across all our emergency departments, but we'll take this time on this pilot to see what needs to be improved or what can be improved and what doesn't work, because I think one of the things that we've seen uh, through the network, and it's a network of clinicians and GPs and, and primary and secondary care who've brought forward uh, the majority of the work and the recommendations in this report that we must see primary and secondary care working side by side. And I think that's one of the things we'd have actually seen coming out of COVID is the real joint up, the, the breaking down of silos between primary and secondary care. And I want to make sure that we can maintain that even post this pandemic. If members speak to their question, they might get the remaining members uh, to be able to ask the question in the first place. So, Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Minister, thanks for your answer. I spoke to uh, ICU nursing staff recently, uh, Minister, uh, who are doing incredible work but feel uh, overwork, undervalued, and underpaid. Some of those workers have increased stress levels, something you alluded to already. Some have left the NHS. Uh, Could I could... remind a member? I've just asked members to stick yeah. with their question, please. Yeah. Um, they didn't sign up for the current situation. So, what's the Minister's uh, assessment of nursing capacity in ICU? We owe them a huge debt of gratitude, but are we appropriately equipped with enough uh, of them? Um, and, and again, I, I thank the, the member because I know he has raised a number of issues in specific in regards to ICU nurses and the banding and the pay grades as well. It's something that our chief nursing officer is currently reflecting on to see what can be done and how it should be done and when it can be done because one of the most strenuous and stressful places that we have uh, across our health service, no matter where, um, a, a lot of it is strenuous and stressful, those working in the ICU department at this minute in time are under advanced uh, and extreme, extreme pressures because of the number of patients they're working on. And Mr Speaker, that's when I referred to earlier on, I think that's addition, that additional stream. When we're now looking at those care ratios, which aren't their normal practice, they are being supported by other healthcare workers and other professionals, but it's the stress and I suppose it's the expertise of those ICU nurses. And they're a group, the ICU nurses, you know, anaesthetists, theatre nurses, are a group out of that uh, original, I think, 1,600 that we're short of. They're, they're a group that we're specifically uh, targeting as one of the ones we'd asked, you know, for our workforce appeal uh, actually come back and help us out because that is where we are seeing and experience uh, the majority of the strain. And that's why also as well, one of the things we did um, during the first strain was making sure that we had that psychological uh, um, and, and mental health support for our healthcare workers as well, because we know um, not only in society is that going to be a need, but it's also a need in our current workforce. So we want to make sure that they're providing all the support that they need. Roy Roy Beggs. Speaker, uh, earlier reference made to hospitals working at 106 per cent and that kind of implications for uh, ambulance handover. So my question to the Minister is, uh, would he recognise that there is a need for the executive to come together to ensure that our AMDA service, our, our entire health service, can operate and treat whoever is arriving uh, at our action and emergency units, irrespective of their needs? Yeah, you know, and that's, I, I think, what the member um, highlights is the desire of everybody uh, working across the health and social care system, um, from our nurses, from our doctors, from our porters. Uh, from the administration teams, community pharmacy, uh, GPs, and you know, people in the department as well, want to make sure that we have a service that can deliver for everyone, deliver the service they need when they need it and where they need it as well. And this is a strenuous time um, across the entirety of our service, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there was many proposed reviews that have been put in place from Bangoa to Compton. Um, that transformation process was, was starting, is continuing to go at a level, not at the pace that we needed to go at, but it continues uh, to be done within, within and across our, our health and social care system. Because, Mr Speaker, what we've said before here uh, is currently we're running, trying to run three health services, our current health service, a transformational health service, and a COVID health service. And one of the things why we're seeing that percentage uh, occupancy of beds 
is because unlike the first wave, um, where we downturned the majority uh, uh, of our procedures, this time our health service is trying to keep as many of those procedures and those services going at the same time. So they're really pushing the limits so we can deliver for the people of Northern Ireland the health care that they want, the health care that they deserve. And that's why I think this House should be indebted to the entirety of our health care family across Northern Ireland. And that concludes this item of business. Thank you, members. Members, just take a raise for a moment, please.